Well, our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 through 34. Let's listen to what the Word has to say. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to express my appreciation for the invitation. I met with Arch uh, a few months ago, and Bob's very generous uh, uh, introduction and, and welcome today to share, the, to share the pulpit and to share the message. Uh, I bring you greetings from the foundation, your, your Florida United Methodist Foundation, our board, our, our staff. Uh, we are here to be your partner in ministry in whatever way we can, in particularly all things regarding stewardship. Now, I am absolutely well aware that when you call somebody in from the foundation to come and talk about stewardship, that I notice a few of you have got a real solid grip on your wallet, and maybe clutching that purse a little, a little tighter than, than you ordinarily would. And that's a, a reasonable uh, response because, unfortunately, in the church, we have allowed stewardship to become synonymous with the word fundraising. And it's so much more than that. Let's acknowledge that it is about our financial support of the church, but it's really much more than that. I was... Uh, not aware until this morning that you're having a, uh, a series on discipleship coming up. And stewardship is better understood as being synonymous with discipleship than it is with simply uh, separating you from your money. Discipleship is about a way of life. Stewardship is a way of life. It's more than just the little green offering envelope in the, in the offering plate or filling out a pledge card or leaving a bequest from your will, although we encourage you to do all of the above. But stewardship properly understood is a lifestyle. It's how we live every moment of our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. It informs everything we say, everything we do, and trust me, your children, your grandchildren are watching. That's how they learn how to be Christian disciples and Christian stewards. Remember the word stewardship, or the word steward simply refers to somebody who manages something that belongs to somebody else. None of this stuff is ours. And the thing also to remember about stewardship is that it's not about the church's need to receive, it's about our need to give. We are bold to proclaim in the first chapter of the Bible that we are made in the image of God. And one of the defining characteristics of God is generosity. It's God's ongoing creation. It's the beautiful morning we woke up to today. It's an abundant world in which we live. Now, I happen to have a favorite psalm. I'm sure many of you have a favorite psalm, and I'll bet for many of you that is number 23. I bet many of you, if not all of you, could probably recite it by, from memory, probably using the old the King James Version. But 
I feel sorry, and because my favorite one, the one I'm, I feel sorry for is 24, because it has to follow 23. It's a tough act to follow. But Psalm 24, the very first verse, is an absolutely profound statement of God's ownership and sovereignty over all of us. Here's how it goes. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they who dwell therein. That is an unambiguous statement of who all this belongs to. It, it, the psalmist didn't say, well, the earth is the Lord's on Sunday morning, but the other six days you're sort of on your own. No, the earth is the Lord's. And then that wonderful word fullness that conjures up that abundance that we live in. We often let ourselves slip into a theology of scarcity. What do we don't have rather than what we do have? What has God blessed us with so richly? It's an abundant world that God has given us. And then it's also very clear that the world, what is in the world, all that stuff, and we ourselves belong to God. When we totally embrace what that, is, what that tells us, when we understand that, this is, that everything we have is simply a temporary stewardship issue because we're not going to be here for very long. God is calling us to share what God has showered upon us. That's what stewardship is all about. But you know, we live in a world that sends complete 180 degree out of phase message, don't we? I was following a big old uh, SUV, it was huge, and on the back was a bumper sticker, and it said, he who dies with the most toys wins. You seen that one? And my wife says, well, there, there's really a corollary to that, and it should say, she who dies with the most shoes wins. But that's, that's the world in, in which we live. We, we are told that we, we need more and more stuff in order to be fulfilled and happy. I learned something very interesting, and I was kind of warmed by it, because last January, about the middle of January, I discovered that I had some really good friends who work at Best Buy because they kept sending me helpful emails and, and mailings about how I could enhance my, my uh, enjoyment of that great national secular holiday, the Super Bowl, by only getting a bigger TV than what I already had. Well, I resisted the temptation. My wife wouldn't have let me do it anyway, but, but that's the world we live in. We gotta have more and more and more stuff. And let me tell you, as soon as you get that 50-inch TV, guess what, there'll be a 60 and a 70 and 80, and pretty soon we'll have to be building home theaters in our homes. And if that's how we get our satisfaction in life for more stuff, we will never be happy because there will always be something else to get. Now, it's interesting, in my neighborhood, I live in the Orlando area, when I drive around the neighborhood during the daytime, the driveways are empty, as you might expect. Everybody's at work or school or volunteering, whatever they do during the day. But you drive around that neighborhood at night, and the driveways are full of cars, SUVs, pickup trucks. Why is that? There's no room in the garage because of all the stuff we've crammed into our garages. I eat in it, you're gonna love this, I even learned the other day that there are now something, uh, things called storage condominiums. I'm not talking about the temporary, uh, you rent uh, the, the storage locker type of thing. No, not that, this is a condominium. You can get a mortgage on your condominium and put your stuff there, and maybe, I don't know, you go visit it occasionally. Hello, stuff, how you doing? It's, it's silly, but it's the world in which we live. And it's not the, the message of, of the gospel, the message that Bob just read. Um, but it's endemic. It's part of our, our culture and our society. My wife, Leanne, is a United Methodist pastor, and which her, her very first assignment, right out of seminary, she was as green as they can be. She was 20-something years, 25, 26 years old. And she was assigned, appointed to a, a church in the Chicago area called Parish of the Reconciliation, great name for a church. It was in an even better location. It was in the shadows of Wrigley Field in Chicago. The church actually made more money uh, selling parking places to Cubs fans than they, than they did from their offerings. But she was doing a Bible study one night, and it was, like, like I said, probably the first thing she'd ever done there. So she was going around the room and asking people if they would introduce themselves and share their favorite Bible verse. So she came to a lady whose name was Marge, and she uh, stood up and said, my name is Marge, and my favorite Bible verse is, God helps those who help themselves. 
Now, Leanne knew full well that wasn't in the Bible. But she was also this rookie pastor. She didn't quite know what to do. By the way, does anybody know where that actually comes from? Benjamin Franklin, that quintessential American, God helps those who help themselves. Well, think about that for a minute. Okay, God, I'm looking out for me, number one. I'm in it for myself, and you're going to help me do it, right, God? God helps those who help themselves. No, that's not what Jesus had in mind when he said, when you, when you have done it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you have done it to me. So Leanne kind of nudged Marge a little bit, say, Marge, you maybe have a, uh, maybe a second favorite Bible verse. She was nervous because she had, had a feeling what was coming, and Marge said, well, indeed I do. Pull thyself up by thine own bootstraps. <laughs> Equally non-biblical. But that's the world, and it's funny, we can laugh about it, but it's, it's also kind of sad because that's, that's the world that we live in. But the gospel is telling and sending us a very different message. Let's, let's unpack that gospel reading that Bob just read from, uh, from Matthew's gospel. This occurs in the, in the gospel of Matthew after the Beatitudes, and Jesus and his disciples are basically just walking around the countryside, assembling crowds uh, to listen to, to Jesus preach and teach. And let's think for a minute about the kind of people that were following him around. These were not the first century equivalent of Goldman Sachs investment bankers. These were people who were living right on the edge, right on the edge. Uh, life expectancy was estimated to be roughly 35 years. You lived hand to mouth. Lots of infant mortality, and many women died in childbirth. They obviously didn't have the medical uh, technology that, that we do today. And then top it all off, they're invaded and held in a, a captive state of the Roman Empire. So they, they had it pretty tough. But then Jesus says, but, but don't worry about all this stuff. You can't serve God and wealth. He was telling a group of people who had nothing that they couldn't serve wealth. That probably wasn't too big a stretch for them because they didn't have any to start with. But he says, goes on to say, don't worry about what you'll eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, by extension in our century, what you will drive, where you will live, what schools you can afford to send your kids to. But rather, put first the kingdom of God. Put first the kingdom of God. And then he says, and notice that the very end of that passage, and all these things will be given to you because your heavenly Father knows you need these things. But don't obsess over it because there will never be enough to make you happy. I guarantee it. You have to put first the kingdom of God and get your priorities in line. I got to tell you, I have yet to meet an unhappy tither. There may be a grumpy tither, maybe somebody here today, although I seriously doubt it, because people who have put giving and support of the mission and ministry of this church ahead of uh, that 50, 60, 70 inch TV screen are people who've got their priorities lined up, and all these things will be given to you. Now, I'm not, believe me, I'm not trying to toe into the so-called prosperity gospel that uh, uh, well-coiffed uh, TV evangelists <laughs> like, to, like to share with us. There's no quid pro quo. That isn't what I'm talking about. But if we get our lives ordered around a life of generosity and giving and gratitude, then we've got ourselves in the right place. But like I said, it's hard to do, and I, I preach to myself about that as much as anybody else. And you know, I really came home to me, in of all places, a 1995 Plymouth Voyager minivan. We were, uh, this is years ago, this was in about 1995 or 96, and uh, Leanne, my wife, had, had baptized a little child that morning in worship, and the family had invited our family and several other families from church, family, friends, neighbors, grandparents, to come to their house for a, uh, a celebration, a brunch, following the baptism of the little girl. So uh, I'd never been there before, and th this was back before GPS, so I <laughs> had gotten a map and said, okay, turn left and right. So we were pulling up to this house, and I was just stunned by it. It was so gorgeous and opulent. It was right out of Architectural Digest or uh, other 
excuse me, Southern Living, and it was stunningly uh, opulent, and the inside was every bit as stunning as the outside, and it was a lovely occasion, beautiful uh, flower arrangements, the food was spectacular, and at the end of, of that uh, celebration, it came time for us, of course, everybody to go home, so we piled the kids into that 95 Plymouth minivan, and we're on the way back to our parsonage. Uh, which was happened to have been built in 1855 and showed every year of its uh, of its <laughs> of its age, and I will confess to you that I was in complete and abject violation of the tenth commandment. You know that one, one about coveting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was off the edge of the scale in coveting at that moment. And to make it worse, I wasn't content to sort of wallow in my own covetousness. I was determined that the rest of the family was going to get in on it as well. So I decided I would take an informal poll of everybody in the minivan. So I did. And I started with the youngest, Simon, who is then about three years old. I said, Simon, what would you change about our house if there was one thing you could change? And he said, well, I'd like a fireplace. I cannot tell you why a house built in 1855 in Chicago didn't have a fireplace, but it didn't. Uh, so then next was Theo. He was about six years old at the time. Theo, what would you change about our house? He said, well, I'd like to have my own bedroom so I don't have to share it with uh, you know who. Uh, I said, Leanne, what about you? What would you change? And she said, oh, I'd love another bathroom. We all shared one uh, upstairs bathroom, all five of us. And somebody said to me, uh, what, would you, what would you like? And I said, well, you know, I would really like a gourmet kitchen, granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, walk-in pantry, all of the goodies. But, you know, at that time, I realized that there was a fifth person in the minivan who hadn't said anything. And it was Carrie our oldest, who was in the back row, the very rear row of seats in these minivans. You need to know something about Carrie. She has Down syndrome. So she was back there in her domain, you know, doing whatever she does. So I said, Carrie, what would you change about our house? And Carrie said in a very calm, sweet voice, I wouldn't change anything as long as we have love. I wouldn't change anything as long as we had love. Well, that hit me right upside the head like a ton of bricks. You see, she understood what Jesus was trying to tell us in the sixth chapter of Matthew, that all that stuff we want, that, that extra bathroom, the fancy kitchen, the fireplace, our own bedroom, none of that matters unless we have love. And where does that love come from? It comes only from one place, and that is God. And God is calling on us to share that love, whether we do it through volunteerism, through, through financial giving, through whatever, we are being called by God to share what we have. One last story. Uh, I'm looking around the room, and I got a feeling that you're going to be able to play this little fill-in-the-blank game pretty easily with me, so let's try it. Rogers and Hammerstein, right. Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, their first show together was Oklahoma. They had several huge hits. They had Carousel, South Pacific, The King and I, The Sound of Music. Honestly, there were a few clunkers in there, too. Nobody remembers Pipe Dream or Allegro or Me and Juliet. Maybe some people do, but only the real diehard theater groupies do. But anyway, they had this string of unbelievable success. And the way they worked was they did meticulous research on the characters they were writing about, whether they were providing them with a script, words to say, or words to, uh, to sing in a song. And Hammerstein in particular was, was the guy that did most of this research. So he was working on the, the show called The Sound of Music. And he was in particular, he was working on the character of the mother abbess or the mother superior, the, the head nun at the convent where Maria uh, is a, uh, uh, an apprentice. And uh, he struck up a, co a correspondence with a nun whose name was Sister Gregory. And Sister Gregory was a professor at Rosary College in suburban Chicago. And Hammerstein and, and she, you know, corresponded over several, several uh, weeks or months on tr Hammerstein trying to get inside the head of a person who can, uh, does, gives their life to full-time Christian service. So he asked the question, what is it about, you know, what you do that, 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 that drives you? And Sister Gregory wrote him back, and she said, the fundamental question that we're being asked by God is how will you spend your love? How will you spend your love? Think about that. That's a fabulous question. 
because of the assumptions that are in that, that question. It's not, if you have any love, how will you spend it? No, it says, how will you spend your love? It assumes you've been given a measure of love, and the source of that love is only one person, one thing, one, one, one God. It's God who is the source of that love. So whether we spend it uh, by writing a check or whatever we may do, we are being called by God to spend our love. Now, the next time you see a production of The Sound of Music or you, uh, you watch a rerun on, on television, pay attention because that line is in there. That's what he actually used that line and has the, the mother superior speak that to Maria. How will you spend your love? So my prayer for us today is that we will spend our love extravagantly, generously, maybe even foolishly, but that we will spend that love that has been given to us by the source of all that we have and all that we are, and that source, of course, is God. God bless you, and thank you for the opportunity to share with you today. Thanks.